It's a great pleasure to, to welcome you and to welcome Charles Taylor uh, to his uh, afternoon with us to reflect on meditation and the lives of faith. Um, this is uh, sponsored by the John Main Center and the Berkeley Center here. Um, uh, Tim and Dennis, were you going to say something? Where's Tim? Oh, okay. <laughs> Dennis has been struck speechless. But, uh. <laughs> so I, I am Tim Casey. Uh, I'm the director of the John Main Center. Um, one of the things I was going to actually mention here was, uh, does anybody know what country is the most anxious country in the world, according to The Economist? Any guesses? It's us. Yeah, <laughs> the United States of anxiety, that's us. And um, 60 to 90 percent of doctors, uh, doctor visits, excuse me, are linked to stress. I recently met with somebody who is uh, a top person at Google, and uh, he said that we live in an attention economy. Attention economy. The product is no longer a good or a service. It's your very attention. And therefore, we have to choose our boundaries. We have to choose how we relate to technology, how we relate to others, and to choose what to focus on. And so here at Georgetown, one of the values that we have is contemplation in action, or contemplatives in action. And our work at the John Main Center is focused on fostering this value, fostering it here, fostering it beyond the borders uh, of this campus. And so it's with great pleasure that I get to introduce two contemplatives in action. So Father Lawrence Freeman and Professor Charles Taylor. So thank you. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Well, thank you, Tim. So as we, we, we usually do, we're going to invite you to begin uh, the session with a short period of meditation. We put the meditation into action. Uh, so maybe you'd just like to prepare for a moment. Meditation involves the whole person, the body, the mind, and the spirit. And I'll, there are many ways into the silence and stillness of meditation. Let me just share with you uh, the essential teaching uh, of our tradition. We sit still and with our back straight, relaxed but alert, close our eyes lightly, and then silently, interiorly in mind and heart, begin to recite a single word, a mantra or a sacred word, giving it our undivided attention. And when our attention wanders, we return gently and faithfully to the word. Obviously, if you have your own words, stay with that, but the word that we recommend is the word Maranatha. Maranatha. This is a way that you might like to practice, and we'll take just a few minutes to meditate now before we begin our discussions. Good. So uh, my students here at Georgetown, who I meditate with at the beginning of each class, tell me that the meditation is the best part of the class. <laughs> I don't think, you may not say that at the end of our session with Charles today, but I think you'll understand why it is a good thing <laughs> to begin uh, a session like this with meditation. Um, Charles Taylor uh, is a, a Montrealer, Canadian, and French and English uh, stock, um, professor uh, emeritus at uh, McGill. His training uh, was at McGill and at, at Oxford, where he was a fellow of All Souls College, where you studied under Isaiah Berlin. Um, best known for his contributions to political philosophy, philosophy of social science and the history of philosophy and intellectual history. Two books uh, of yours that have affected, I think, uh, me most, most powerfully, The Sources of the Self and 
the secular age. And his work has earned him uh, worldwide recognition and the Kyoto Prize and the Templeton Prize, in addition to widespread uh, recognition and esteem among his philosophical peers. It says here that you are a practicing Roman Catholic, which probably means you're still not perfect. <laughs> still practicing that. Still working on it. Still working on it. But uh, in, in later years, your work has turned to the philosophy of, of religion. And uh, in that, you have helped uh, uh, people of all uh, households of faith, I think, to understand how uh, faith and religious traditions uh, relate to the modern age, um, which you have so uh, powerfully analyzed and, and helped us to understand. So, Charles, thank you for being with us, and welcome. Yes, yes, okay. well, thank you very much. Okay. Uh, I have <laughs> no doubt myself that the meditation is the best part, particularly <laughs> because, talking about the other introduction given by, De, that uh, I was very anxious arriving here because nobody knows where the Riggs Library <laughs> is. I mean, we did a scientific survey about one. <laughs> but, but anyway, but now I'm here, I recognize I've been here before and I'm very pleased <laughs> to be back. Yeah. So what I'd like to talk about today is to come into the issue of the place of meditation in modern spiritual life through looking at what we've been through in no, I hope this is no, this is not going to be <laughs> what we've been through in really Western culture in the epoch that people talk of as an epoch of, of secularization. And <clears throat> this is a kind of very odd discourse which I have learned from some very remarkable people because it's a discourse that requires that you put together theology sociology or social science and history. And I'm, apart from an undergraduate degree in history, I know I really haven't studied any of those, which puts me in a perfect position. But <laughs> I I'm benefit from three remarkable thinkers who have pioneered the work that I want to talk about now. One is of course, David Martin, I don't know if you know the name, at LSE, who wrote the wonderful work on secularization. The other is Hans Joas of Berlin, and the third, of course, is Jose Casanova of your own university here. And <clears throat> I'm a little bit channeling them, or maybe mangling <laughs> them, in trying to get a handle on what's been happening in the last centuries, but particularly the 20th into the 21st century, some very big changes in religious life, which have been, which can be called secularization in a way, but which have been mistaken for the kind of secularization which the standard theories after the Second World War put forward, namely secularization means simply the decline of religion. And it's not really that, it's something rather different, but that's what I'd like to, to look at. Now, Maybe, and, and I have another introductory <laughs> remark because you have to make this obviously clear. We come from very different situations. Oh, Even I, you know, a few miles to the north, come from a very different situation from the United States and all of us from the European societies. But one of the first ways I'd like to tackle what's happened in the last century, let's say, is to look at, not this situation here, but the situation of many European societies which were basically for many centuries confessional states. Now, I have a sort of insight into that because the only part of North America which resembles that situation is, of course, was Catholic, French-speaking Quebec, which I grew up in. <clears throat> and here you have two kinds of like bundled religious life. I want to use this, this, this expression, which have since become unbundled. Okay, the first kind of bundling that you see in those societies and that I brought, was brought up with in, in my society in Quebec is that belonging to a given church, the same people belong to a certain political structure, the same people share a certain national sense of identity, the same people share a very strong agreement on who's in and who's out, on what the, the moral <clears throat> demands are and so on. All these things come together same community shares in all of them. So you get in societies like this, people who, begin, who don't, um, if you ask them, is that a religious uh, demand or not? 
they don't see, you know, they don't understand the nature of the question. Incidentally, I'm going to jump around a little bit, but a great deal of the stupider kinds of Islamophobia that's circulating here, where people think that female genital mutilation is, is, is Islamic and so on, come from that because in certain societies, very bundled societies, people don't make a distinction between traditional culture and the religion and, uh, and, uh, and so on, so that for them it's all religion, but for any, any intelligent imam, clearly there's a boundary between things which are customary and things which belong to the to, to the din, to the proper Muslim understanding. But that's one kind of bundling. And that kind of bundling has come undone in almost all Western societies. So that you get now people wandering off in different directions. They may, the next neighbor neighbor may belong to the same church as them, but they, they are related in their political views to quite different people in their other kinds of belongings in life to quite different people and so on. That, the shattering of that kind of bundling takes place. Now, this is not surprising to you because the United States pioneered this unbundling, right? Uh, the original colonies that became the states of this republic were all very heavily bundled. They all had established churches, most of them anyway. And then that, then the read of the first awakening and so on, the second great awakening, sorry, that became real, uh, real unbundling. So you're, you are in a sense ahead of that particular curve, but everyone else is in some sense catching up. Now the second kind of bundling, which has also been undone, is really this, that let's think of all the different facets of our spiritual life. Let's, let's go back to a bundled situation in a very large church, again, my childhood, right, the same parish. Within the same parish, you had the, the different weekly and other uh, liturgies. You had various kinds of caritative organizations uh, organizing help for people. You had various particular sodalities devoted to certain kinds of prayer. You had some people following a certain uh, particular disciplines of, of um, of uh, devotion, you had uh, excursions made at a pilgrimage to, maybe not to the Holy Land, maybe just to <laughs> Santa de Bellevue and so on. But you see, all these things become part of this life of the same community. Now, that's also been substantially unbundled in Western society, so that people may be may go to a church or not with some. Uh, with some people uh, in some organization, but then perhaps they have a, a, a life of meditation, a quite other one, and perhaps then they belong to Oxfam or something like that as far as their, uh, as their as were NGO life is concerned, and so on, and so on, and so on. These multiple unbundlings, what's brought this about? Well, what's brought this about has been a great push or development in various kinds of individualism, but in particular one kind, whereby what I want to call the ethic of authenticity, that is the idea that each human being has their own way of being human and they should find it and not simply conform to some external standard, that ethic has become utterly widespread in Western society. I mean, it, it starts at the time of the Romantics and certainly in among minority of cultural creators through the 19th century, it was, you know, absolutely standard in a sense that uh, the idea of artistic creation was inseparable from that of originality. But this has become something where people talk in a banal way in the, our world of doing your own thing and so on. So it's made a tremendous difference to the way people understand their spiritual lives. And since this went along with, of course, the great, uh, very impressive sexual revolution of the 1960s, there came to be a great lack, a lack of fit between all these people's searchings on one hand and the, and the lives of the established churches uh, on the other. Another way you could look at this development is in terms of a concept of, of Christendom. In a certain sense, in the West, we all come out of a Christendom, a Latin Christendom. Now, what I mean by Christendom is a society where it's, in principle, thought that everything, every aspect of society, its politics, its art, <clears throat> its morality, its 
uh, sense of its, its philosophy and so on are all informed by the Christian faith or it can be parallels to this in Islamic societies or parallels to this in a Buddhist society. But all these things are informed by a certain commonly held faith. And what we're describing, what I'm describing as unbundling, you could think of from another point of view as the cracking or breaking apart of Christendom modes of life. It's that, in other words, the different aspects of life, the different things people seek in life, the artistic and other lives, no longer fit into a generally agreed framework of the whole society, which ultimately is capped by a certain common faith. That, of course, is something that the great sociologists like Weber picked up on with the idea of the development of independent spheres of life, political, artistic, and so on, which, as it were, navigate out of the influence of the over, previously overarching religious life. So in a certain way, we are, in a certain sense, rowing away from, from Christendom. Now, what does this lead to? And when you ask that question and try to answer it, you get a, a not only a diverse set of answers, but a conflictual set of answers. Let's try to think of this, how people understand in a society their spiritual life, and I want to use this in a very general sense. I mean, they may be atheists, but they have some inspiration from Nietzsche or from, or from Immanuel Kant and so on, or, or they may be of various kinds of religion, or they may not even be clear that they can place themselves exactly where they place themselves in this spectrum, and that's the most very, very common uh, plight. But, but let's talk about, in this general sense, their spiritual lives, spiritual aspirations, spiritual search. How do they understand how they relate to everyone else, where they are in relation to other people in this regard, in the society. And there are really two, you might even, and now I'm learning sociology, you see as I go on, uh, you might say two ideal types of this kind of understanding. One is the one among people who, who have very much interiorized the ethic of authenticity and know a lot of other people who have and you know, their, their lives are led among other people who have also the same, the same ethic. And they have a picture of the way they fit in the world with others as a, that of independent people seeking, maybe they seek together because they find that they're, they're drawn together in, in their search. But they recognize that they're searching in a field in which there are a great number of other searchers who are taking not quite similar or perhaps quite different directions, right? So you see yourself as in a field of seekers that you have to live with, you have to exchange with, and so on. I've called this the Nova effect in the, in, in, in the book because there are more, in this world, there are more and more new new positions, new ways of approaching uh, certain uh, syntheses of existing, of existing ways or uh, new variants of old ways and so on. So it's a kind of expanding field, expanding field of different spiritual possibilities. Okay, that's one way of seeing. Another way, let's say that you're somebody who was deeply attached to the Christendom perspective, the Christendom mode of life. Then you see this in a quite different light. You see it in a much more tragic light. You see it in the light of a, a wonderful structure, a wonderful as it were, common house in which we all lived, in which we not only shared, not only prayed together, but we had a sense of what the value, central values of civilization were, what the central values of morality were, which we all shared. And this structured life is being gnawed away at, undermined, it's, it's unraveling. That's a very strong sense that people have. And this, this is something you see on both sides of the Atlantic, and the European side and the US side, though it's slightly different. And, but of course, reaches its apex and, and something very acute form when we're looking at morality, sexual morality, issues like gay marriage and so on, the sense of a civilizational form which is which is disintegrating and the need to defend that. In the United States, of course, where, I mean, in a European society like Spain, it's very much, you know, anyway, a lot of Catholics take that stance 
about the Catholic <clears throat> encasing of their society. But in the United States, the same kind of battles arise in an interestingly different way. You have age-old conflicts between, let's say, Protestants, very strong Protestants and Catholics, which are, as it were, the hatchet is buried in order to defend in common against this, this, uh, this threat to Christian America or Christian civilization. Right? So we have another way of living that diversity, right? which is seen as a threatening way, as a, as a slope down, as something very, very, uh, <clears throat> very scary, and we have to uh, fight against. Now, so we're living in a strange world, a conflicted world. I mean, that is, all of us are living in such a way that in some of our lives, we think of ourselves in the first ideal type, or among others, seekers, some of whom we very much or are close to, or less close to, but we want to understand them better. And then at other moments in our lives, we find ourselves in this conflictual situation. And one of the big unanswered questions for myself as a Catholic, for the Catholic Church today, is how to n somehow knit this together and stop it from all <laughs> flying, flying apart. But uh, the, nevertheless, you have here, I think, the the, sorry, the truth about how we live this, and we live it in two ways, and we maybe would overwhelmingly like to live it in one of these ways rather than the other, but we are forced at various times to confront the other, other way as well. So if I can circle back and look at the original impetus that got us all, got Jose and Hans Joas and myself and so on, onto this issue, which was our original great dissatisfaction with the dominant secularization theory of the post-war period, which simply said secularization means the decline of religious faith, the decline of religious practice, because modernity, whatever that means, is incompatible with religious belief on scientific and sociological grounds and so on, and so it's all gonna, all gonna disappear. Well, we were tremendously dissatisfied with this. It just didn't seem to stand up, and Interestingly enough, over the last three or four decades, almost everybody has deserted this, uh, this reading. Right? There are a few holdouts. <laughs> Steve Bruce is still up there in Scotland holding up. But they really, it's, most people are no longer satisfied with this. But they aren't necessarily clear what the alternative of. And we've sort of been proposing an alternative of the kind I've just been describing, where Yes, you might say secularization has happened, but what it, what it means in this sense is this tremendous diversity, this tremendous pluralization of religious forms, both a pluralization whereby people adopt different ones and a pluralization whereby a lot of the different practices of spirituality can be hived off and be led in sort of different kinds of organizations and, and associations. That kind of pluralization is to us the essence of what you could call secularization. And it, it, because what people recognize that they share when they share as different seekers a common world is by definition no longer defined by a certain spirituality because what the whole the whole essence of their sharing is living together in very different spiritual uh, searches and very different spiritual quests, as it were, <clears throat> living together in the same society. And in a sense, you can understand the difference between Europe and North America if you start from this definition of secularization. See, because in Europe, the secularization thesis is no longer really defended by intellectuals. That is, that uh, modernity brings about a decline in religion. But this secularization thesis is very common part of public understanding. Right? That you ask a lot of Europeans about this, and they, yeah, they say, yeah, that's what's been going on. That's you know, that the modern world means uh, the decline of religion. Jose is wonderful on this, as you know, you know. He says, when you ask people in America, how often do you go to church? They terrifically exaggerate. 
right? <laughs> but you don't get checked against the figures. No, 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 no way. If you ask the Europeans, it's the other way around, right? They, <laughs> they don't really allow that they go to church as much as they, as they do. And this is because where the people are living up or down to the, the official story, kind of the official story that their society socially accepts, right? And <clears throat> Europeans, as it were, when they're asked what they're doing, they, they conform to the official story. Whereas in America, well, a lot of people think, you know, you're supposed to have a religion. So they answer pollsters very, very differently. But this, and this official story, how can you understand that that is the European official story? And I think you can if you start off looking at it from the standpoint of this definition that I'm, we're offering of secularization, that pluralization. When pluralization, this kind of tremendous pluralization, hit various European societies, and we see this in the 60s and 70s, in the British case, for instance, masses of people left the churches or no longer went to church and so on, and they were seeking other kinds of ways. Now, in the United States, that's been going on for two centuries, and people, you know, I've always been breaking up churches or breaking out of churches or starting a new church and so on. But it's quite common for these new ways to be ways that are well, Christian or theistic or some kind of transcendental dimension. But in the European case, in a certain sense, the, the Christian, the theistic, the transcendental was so identified with single dominant confessional states and therefore confessions that it became irretrievably tainted with the idea of authoritarianism, with the idea of not listening, with the idea that you've got to be told beforehand what the right thing is to do and you, and they, you don't ask any, any questions. And so for a lot of people breaking out into that kind of pluralization, there was a kind of taint around the various, if you like, Christian or theistic variants of this. You just have to see the tremendous response to certain institutions like Taizé, who never took this stance, right, by young people. And you can see that some of this taint can be removed by meeting people or going to a center of, of a certain kind. So I think you can, if you think that the, the common, as it were, the common development across the whole Western world has been this pluralization, you can understand how it seems to conform to the old style secularization story in Europe, but doesn't at all in the, in the United States. All right, so that being said, I'd like now to talk about what in this world of pluralization, where you have people taking it in the first way I described, in the Nova way, we, we are seekers among other seekers. What, is the, what are the modes of religious life that you see emerging there? And I just want to mention three or four, and I think we're going to immediately begin to recognize why meditation has a place here. Well, number one, of course, difference is that people living that kind of life as seekers don't have a strong sense that they have to defend something which is under attack. Whereas people who have very deep investment in the Christendom story, I mean, think of the you know, previous pope for all my admiration and sympathy for him, Benedict, he had this sense of we have to mount the uh, battlements and fight off, the, <clears throat> et cetera. They don't have this tremendous sense of defense. In a way, Francis is the exact counter example of that, right? You go out there and you live the faith and you're not, you're not feeling defensive. But the second very important difference is that the very old idea, and we old in you know, many, many, many faiths, but very old in the Christian faith too, the idea that the life of faith is a journey, that you're moving along a journey of change, of opening, of being led. Gregory of Nyssa in one way, Augustine, I mean, we can go on and on with many, many such examples. This idea comes back into uh, the forefront as something obvious. Right? No. So the, I mean, the whole discourse of we've got the truth is just doesn't, you know, it doesn't ring true to anyone today because if you're, if you're thinking of your spiritual life as a journey, you 
don't have it. I mean, uh, you, you know, I'm very, I'm very confused about what <laughs> go on in Christ. I mean, that's, that's a central part of what my life of faith is. We're, we're trying to move ahead. So this, this gives you a quite different perspective. And it has very old roots, but it's come back. It's become, if you like, one way of looking at your life has become for people in this world of seekers as an axiom. Right? It, it's a kind of journey. Thirdly, the issue of doubt. Doubt is something which belongs to this kind of faith on a journey, that there are always things you don't understand, that you're mixed up about, that if you think about them enough, maybe I got it all wrong, that you can't help that thought from intruding, and you have to work through it. And... Sometimes you find, I hope you find, I hope I go on finding, that that attempt to work through is what pulls you ahead on the journey. That's part of what makes the journey move so that without doubt you would be, I mean, without, without doubt, <laughs> there's no doubt that doubt is, <laughs> is an essential part of this and you wouldn't be, you wouldn't be capable of moving ahead if you just tried to stifle doubt or you thought it was some kind of negative. But then comes the fourth feature, which I think is the most interesting one, and I don't fully understand it, but I feel very strongly it belongs to this, which is what I want to call the ecumenicism of friendship. That if you're on this kind of journey, you recognize other people on a, uh, on a journey, and okay, it's, it's maybe very different. It's, it's sort of direction or it's guiding, it's guiding light or it's point of repair, we say in French. I mean, it may be different. Eh? It may be Buddhist and Christian and so on. So it has this kind of difference. But you can recognize a similar experience, a similar search. And there's a kind of desire to understand and kinds of exchange emerge. And out of that, a kind of friendship can arise in which, in a curious way, one strengthens each other's uh, continuing search by, this, by reaching across these boundaries. Now, I want to give you a very interesting sociological fact which no one has explained, I think, but I think makes sense in the light of what I'm talking about. That is, that of a lot of the things of Vatican II, which were put forward and then a little bit slid back from, the one that wasn't really was the ecumenical opening. I mean, Benedict had trouble with that in some ways. But, but there really hasn't been much sliding back from that. And I want to attribute that to this new kind of age we're in, where this is one of the features is, I want to call it the ecumenicism of friendship. I mean, there's an ecumenicism of we don't shoot at you, you don't shoot at us. I mean, it's just a very good idea. I mean, if, if, it's, if it replaces <laughs> shooting. But so we patch things up and we get friendly and we meet together and say we're all together and so on. And that's essential when you have certain kinds of movements going on in your society. But it's way behind either praying together, which uh, John Paul did in Assisi, or this kind of exchange that I'm talking about, which I found to be absolutely, you know, common in the world of meditation, right? So I'm getting around to the world of, of meditation. Why is meditation something that is just catching on more and more and more? Well, because this profile that I'm trying to offer of kind of spiritual life and these four, four features, right, of, of uh, <clears throat> journey, the importance of doubt, the ecumenicism of, of, of friendship, this is obviously fits. So life of, I mean, meditation is a kind of journey. It is a, a way of journeying on the path of some kind of faith. And meditating with others, you find that in the Christian meditation movement, there's this immediate plurality. I mean, there are, non, there are also non-Christians that are in it in various ways, but it, confessionally or denominationally, it's already from the very beginning very mixed. I mean, it's the case with 
with John May with the very, very beginning back in, in Montreal that Lawrence and I remember. I thought they were Anglicans, there were others, and so on. So this kind of, if you like, this kind of, uh, what am I going to talk about? Uh, Portrait robot, you see, in French. I mean, there's got a general understanding of what a life of faith is that is common in this world of seekers with those features that I mentioned fit very nicely, neatly, closely with meditation as one of the possible practices that this life can, can sustain. So it's not surprising that more and more people are looking to that as we go ahead. So that's really what I wanted to say here because I think we have a chance to have a, have a discussion. I wanted to you know, bring in some sociology and history in order to try to define a very big change, a very really cataclysmic, in a sense, change, which is happening in our society, in our what we call social imaginary, in our way of understanding how we relate to other people as spiritual beings, right? The conflictual nature of that and on one dimension, but within those that are inhabiting this, as we're, new kind of form of coexistence, which is highly pluralistic, which I've called the NOVA, there's another, another, if you like, form of faith life with certain features, which is something that's very, very, uh, where it fits very well with meditation, fosters meditation, is very often expressed in terms of uh, practice of meditation. So thank you very much, and let's have a discussion. Thank you, Charles. Great, you gave us a lot to, a lot to uh, d discuss. So I, I want to just share a few thoughts with you um, initially, and then we'll open it up to, for everyone to, to raise some questions and into the into discussion with you. I, I thought um, just this question of, uh, of identity, that, as you say, the unbundling of religious traditions has caused a lot of conflict. Uh, those who feel they have to defend what's being lost and, and, um, and those who are angry with what has been and are glad to get rid of it. You know, in Quebec, I think has both, has both and so has Ireland. Uh, I think Irish, Irish Catholicism, very, like very similar, yeah. yeah. I understand right now. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, actually, when John Main came to Montreal, he said, uh, he said, Ireland is going to be about 10 years behind. <laughs> it's going to happen, yeah. So, but, um, so the, and yet, we see this globally, too, with globalization. Globalization has bring, brought many benefits, but at the same time, it has created a lot of local conflicts. Uh, are often arising out of even, you know, the Islamicist thing, arising out of a, a feeling of a loss of identity. So I just, uh, I, I invited uh, one of our meditators recently, who is a businessman, to speak <clears throat> to my class here. And somebody asked him, uh, you know, how important is it for you that you meditate within a religious tradition? And he said, well, I'm Argentinian. So he said, my main religion is football. <laughs> and he said, my team uh, has, wears a certain jersey, and, uh, and I, I, I support that team. I belong to that team. That's my, my identity is with that team. But it doesn't mean that I don't play with other teams. <laughs> I mean, there's, there may be some uh, limits to that metaphor, but do, do, because you know, we're not trying to win against other religions, I suppose. But nevertheless, it's the game. Do you think that this idea of non-competitive playing or non-competitive collaboration, exploration, do you think that's relevant to the future? Yes, I think so. I think more and more people find that, I mean, granted, you see that you have this other attitude towards doubt, towards things that don't seem to fit together, that instead of, you know, Catholic, meet a Buddhist, right? Uh, instead of having, oh, there's various things in theism which don't really work very well, mm. what am I uh, you since you're working through all that with a sense that, of course, you're not properly understanding it, you can very often strike off an exchange where, in all sorts of ways, you get a sense of 
how to move forward. You get a sense, even from getting the difference clearer, you get a sense that, wow, even across this difference, there are certain similar experiences. You get, so you can get encouragement from a friend across that barrier the same way as you can. Mm. Uh, so I can see a world in which, um, well, I see it around me, in which more and more this kind of, of connection comes up. Now, you know, with John Lane, with yourself, meeting the Dalai Lama, you've had something like this kind of experience. I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm sure you could describe it mm. better than me. Or when I'm thinking of Thomas Merton, Thomas Merton is, uh, 100th anniversary is coming up and I'm actually going to give a talk in Gethsemane out there. Mm. Because they've invited me, to, uh, I'm very honored by that, but, but this is only 100 years. Mm. And he was some kind of pioneer yes. in that kind of thing. Yes. Right? And mm. why was he, I mean, uh, this is maybe a matter of individual life, but why is he a figure who has caught on, mm. you know, begins to catch on and more and more and more? I think this is mm. a game. It's interesting, I, John Main was staying at Gethsemane when he, in spending a few days in Merton's Hermitage, this was in 73 or 74 before we came to Montreal. And it was there that he decided, actually, to come to Montreal oh, <laughs> to sort of branch out. So it was, there was a continuity with, with Merton. Well, I'll, just, I'll mention that. Yeah, right, yeah. Um, so the other question I, I, I also wanted to raise, and then we'll, was um, uh, this, uh, will, will uh, you know, there have been other periods of cultural deconstruction. Maybe this is... Do you think, I, I'm interested in general if you think there have been any, if this is the most dramatic period, but I suppose the French Revolution was equally dramatic and fast moving, I don't know. But um, anyway, this is certainly a major period of, of, of cultural symbolic change. The old symbols have, have disintegrated and, and we don't quite know what the new ones are. Uh, so we look for, for meaning often without key signifiers and key signs. Um, is there anything that you could see historically looking at what we're going through today, which is exciting, but worrying, but exciting? Would you say that there's anything in what we are, what, what is disintegrating today that would worry you that might be lost, mm -hmm. that we might lose something quintessentially human? I, we're having a meditatio seminar later this year on meditation and science. Uh, and led by a world expert on artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I wonder whether you feel there's anything, not, not so much even at the intellectual level, but maybe at the technological level and the impact of te technology on our, our culture and on our, uh, our spirituality. Mm -hmm. Is there anything in that that you think that would make you fear we might actually lose it and, and then not only lose it, but actually forget what it is that we lost. Yeah, no, I mean, I don't think, uh, it's something very important, but I don't think it's, I don't think it's irretrievable loss, but it's something that's uh, not that's quite as bad, but almost as bad, that for certain people, the barriers to getting back to it are very great. Now, for instance, in this domain you're talking about, I know people, including people very close to me who are very much involved in computer reconstructions of <laughs> thinking and so on. Mm. They really get wound up in this, and they can't see that there's something very important missing in the account, something very, they can't capture. It becomes so exciting, so en ballon, mm. that they, they just find it very, very difficult to grasp this. And you find this in the really strong mechanistic reductionists like Dan Dennett and so on. They, you know, they, um, they say crazy things like, you know, phenomenology doesn't exist. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. you, just, you just think you're, th I mean, <laughs> John Searle's character is true as this, you just think you're thinking. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. but, so, but they don't have a feel for this anymore, no. right? Now, now, it isn't irretrievably lost because there's gonna be people always reacting to that. Yes. But there are people in whole media that are gonna find it very difficult to break through <clears throat> to that kind of human understanding again. And I think that goes in all sorts of, <clears throat> all sorts of domains. Could you, could you see, you know, the economically or sociologically, there's a, there's a prediction coming through a lot of, a lot of fiction and, and, and science fiction of um, 
a, a, a society which is really split between the un, an underclass. The cyborg. Uh, yes. <laughs> do you think that that could that could relate also to a society in which you have people who feel and people who are so absorbed in technology or externalized mm. activity that they a actually don't know that they're not feeling? No. Does that make sense? Well, I mean, there's a great science fiction dystopian novel <clears throat> to be written here. I'm sure they have been written. I just don't believe that's possible. No. See, I think that it, you know, the other stuff always breaks through, and you see it all the time. I mean, you see it among your graduate students, <laughs> the ones that are totally into this kind of thing, and then at one point, you know, they read uh, Dostoevsky or Anna Karenina, yeah. and, mm. and uh, hey, <laughs> it isn't all there. But it's certainly so. I I don't really fear. I don't see. Just couldn't be well, that it would be irretrievably lost. I mean, yeah. you can get wonderful novel. You know, going back to Huxley, yeah. Brave New World, uh, 1984. These novels in which this horrifying prospect is put before you, and I'm mm. all for people writing those novels because. <laughs> <laughs> but I just don't see how you can mm. keep this thing down all the time. And so we. Yeah. But you we, yeah, sorry, sorry. Go. but you can make it very hard for people in certain media right. to break through to it. Until we invent a machine that meditates for you. <laughs> 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 okay. one, one final uh, personal question about meditation. Uh, I remember coming uh, years ago in Montreal to your home and uh, you were sitting in the kitchen reading and uh, your five daughters were all around you, <laughs> making a lot of noise. And you were uh, focusing whatever you were reading, you were totally absorbed in. Great examples for me I was of the power of attention. <laughs> so I'm wondering how you would uh, intellectually uh, or epistemologically, whatever, understand the power of attention in relation to meditation that um, in meditation as the Desert Fathers, which is the tradition, as you know, that John Main uh, passed on, uh, there's, a, there's a key phrase, prayer, and by that they nearly always meant the prayer of the heart or meditation. So prayer is the laying aside of thoughts. So how, how do you see that intellectually? That there, that there are, maybe you would simply say, like the, like the, the, the Bible, there's a time for thinking and a time for taking the attention off your thoughts, mm -hmm. time yeah. for being without thought. Does that, would you, would you go along with that? Yeah, but it's also very difficult. I mean, and, and it's harder, for, maybe harder for intellectuals mm. to do that. I mean, the kind of attention I had in the kitchen there, right, is something that is itself inimical to uh, meditation. Yes. Yeah, see, yes. I'm following my mm. thought train. Instantly, as soon as they started fighting, it breaks, right? If it's, if it's happy noise, <laughs> ah, yes, it's happy <laughs> I think a lot of a lot of parents have that experience, right? If it's happy noise, it's fine. Yeah. But, it, but, it, oh, yeah. <laughs> but <clears throat> that kind of concentration is also, and I find, I mean, I probably find meditation much more difficult than a lot of people do, hmm. for that reason, because I, you know, can easily start thinking, yeah. and start, you know. We had a, a, a and then I'll finish. We we had a. a a leading uh, business or investor speak here once, and he was describing meditation, and he said, meditation's great, it's given me all these qualities, and he wasn't a religious person, he was just saying how great meditation was for, you know, for, for, for clarity and balance and creativity, and he says, and then I meditate, and then sometimes you get these fantastic ideas. Yeah. Well, I know, that's right. Really great ideas of sort of investment and all that. <laughs> And then I thought, oh, no, he didn't get it. And then, then, he, then he said to the students, he said, but then you've got to let it go. <laughs> Would you That's advise the same on a few? If yeah, I know, but it's very hard. I mean, exactly. I feel guilty when I get up. <laughs> wow, I've solved that problem. <laughs> but, you know, I sometimes go to sleep and I wake up and I solve the problem. I mean, I solve the solution has somehow come together. It, mm, mm. It, so it's be doing something quite different. It can bring that about, but you have to keep that from intruding. Mm. Yes. Would you, the, the, what Robert uh, Bueller says about the online, offline yeah. modalities, okay. would you uh, uh, go along with that? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a good image. I mean, mm. yeah. yeah. 
Okay, well, thank you. I think we open up to the, uh, to the uh, general audience, please. Professor Taylor, I'd like to ask you a question regarding, um, we had mentioned regarding the cultural aspect of what it means to be religious today. And I was wondering your thoughts regarding, um, there seems to be this sort of cultural hegemony that goes on with religious pluralism. And what I mean by that is, um, the example I like to give is like, for instance, in New York in the 20th century, you had your Irish, and you had the Polish, you had the Germans, you had the, um, and they were very different. And you had the Jewish community. And like two generations later, they all just are white. And it's very different than it was, say, when they first, you know, those com communities originally formed. And so my question is in regards to the modern secular religious atmosphere. What do you see in terms of that, like, hegemonic ideal of, you know, when communities come together or when, you know, liberalism takes, starts to affect your community or conservatism affects it, that there's this, like, sort of one dominant hegemonic narrative of religiosity that comes together where, like, all the liberals sound the same and all the conservatives sound the same and everyone in the middle sort of starts to sound the same. So I'm, I'm just wondering what are your thoughts about that idea of, you know, losing specificity and losing identity and losing um, that, spe that, that special kind of religiousness of what it means to be Muslim or Christian, you know, coming from your background, whether it be Afghan okay. or Pakistani, whatever, compared to in general. Yeah, thank you. Well, I mean, it's probably analogous to the discussion earlier. I don't think that those hegemonies ever become uh, irreversible. They're always being challenged and so on. But yes, for a while they can <clears throat> they can get hold of the storyline. I mean, in the, in the major media, right? Just like in the major media. But uh, but at the base of the society, these very very, I think this is more evident than anywhere else in these large globalized cities like New York or Mumbai and so on. This tremendous number of different religious or other forms of life which are coexisting. And they're learning from each other, and they're changing, <clears throat> and there are new syntheses growing up all all the time. And that is that can be under what for the major newspapers and the major television stations is under the radar <clears throat> what they what they see, but it's nevertheless going on. It's not it's not impeded really by that, and even that hegemony can be can be challenged. But this is a big, big political issue. I think what you're describing is something which is, I think, strangling our democracy. That's another issue. We could get onto this political issue here. Maybe we, maybe we shouldn't. And certain things could be done and should be done, too. <clears throat> Thank you. There's a... Thanks so much. Son? Yeah. Thanks so much for the lovely talk. In addition to the four reasons for the increasing attraction of meditation that you mentioned, one comes to mind, and I'd love to get your thoughts on it. Toward the end of um, Sources of the Self, you make a compelling and to me haunting observation. And I'm not going to get this exactly right, but something about how the demands coming out of the Enlightenment, you know, the categorical imperative, the demands from the Romantic era about being authentic are just almost too much to bear. They're sort of the demands of morality are very, very large, and they might not be enough to really help us love each other. Um, and we need to turn to other sources. And if you add to that you know, the increasing understanding from science about how all the choices we make have impacts on people all the way around the world, every time we turn on the light, every time we buy something, and maybe affecting someone else, there's a sense of like, you know, the, the world is too much with us. You know, it's sort of mm. there's just so the, the moral demands are very high. And meditation may be a way, if you, particularly if you look at it from the Buddhist perspective, of sort of like letting go of the burdens of, of you know, a, a demanding self. I mean, sometimes mm -hmm. that can be used defensively, but sometimes that can be liberating too. I'm wondering if you think, to me, there's some that. that Sorry, uh, what, you, 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 you were going to say, what, what does he think? What your thoughts on that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, no, I mean, I think this is very, very true. I, I had an experience, I went to Thailand about 20 years ago, and I got a report on human rights there, and then I met. Person there who belonged to this movement of engaged, mind you, mind you. yeah, sorry, of engaged Buddhists who were people who were, you know, who were very much uh, involved in that, and uh, democratization, and, and um, he said I take a, took a trip to Europe last year and I went to Germany and I went to the Green Party conference. I mean, this is obviously, he said I didn't understand. They were so full of anger. <laughs> Don't they? <be real. laughs> 
you know, modern Western politics and the government. Yeah. <laughs> Don't they understand? <laughs> He was right. I mean, you could see right away he was right, but you could see also right away, you know, very hard to explain that. <laughs> to, yeah. uh, Sean. Could, could we have another hand up so that we can get the mic to you before? Okay, in the front here. Uh, thank you, Professor Taylor, for that great talk. I have a question about the implications of this for religious institutions. In this world of sort of ethic of authenticity, where individuals are searching, by definition, it's an individual process. How do, ins how do religious institutions adapt to that world? Mm. They're often perceived as being in the other world. And how do institutions adapt to nourish the individual approach, the journey? Yeah. Because you see, it's not simply individual. Nobody is doing, I mean, nobody is doing any successful searching unless they are also with others, maybe following others, maybe working along with others, bouncing their ideas off others. This is something inherently dialogical. So an experience like Taizé, I visited a couple of times, uh, just showed me what is involved here. that. People come because there is maybe something in this Christian thing that is not right. And so they sit and they do some Bible study with others, and then they talk to people. And it starts from their questions. But they really want some help with their questions, right? And this is, this is it's not a structure of a, a normal parish, right? But it is, a, if you like, a Christian institution, a Christian media in which... <clears throat> this kind of search can go on. And what we've got to have, I, in my view, in the Catholic Church is more media of that kind in which people can come and they're not told beforehand, you've got to subscribe to all these <laughs> rules and so on. They're asked what they're, you know, what are you looking for? What, what, is, what really moves you? What, what perplexes you? Now, in a certain way, and people very often criticize this, Within the Catholic Church, this kind of, of situation is being re reflected in the growth of affinity parishes. I mean, you know, there are affinity parishes are nearly, anyway, where I come from, the dominant, the dominant mode. And I, great, I see, that's the moment. <laughs> and I think that they are here too, you know, in, in this, so we I, don't, think, I think we have to co happen? coexist. I, we have to coexist. I think. <laughs> <laughs> the only thing to do is to speak louder than the. <laughs> okay, can we? Thanks. Thank, thank, thank. Is this on? Yes. Yeah. Thank you very much for your wise words. And I, you talked about the interactions that seekers have with other seekers and how that ends up strengthening their own, you know, their own thoughts and their own their, their own findings. Do you? Would you, would you describe that as dialogue, or, or how would you compare that to the idea of dialogue, and would you then tie that back in with paying attention to people? Thank you. Yeah, I mean, definitely it is a mode of dialogue, right? It's a, and it shows the degree to which finding myself, finding oneself, is a matter of, of dialogue. It, it may be a matter of shutting off various relations where you can't you know, people rebel against parents uh, who want to, to be too dominant and so on, but they, they just absolutely need to find other dialogue partners to work things out. You know, it's a kind of, I mean, it's a very unfortunate experience if you're deprived of that. You know? So, I mean, dialogue is so constitutive of human life. You know, from the very beginning, you don't learn a language without, except through exchange with, with caregivers and so on. So. Dialogue is so intrinsic a part of human life, you just never can escape it. And any theory that ignores it is just, <laughs> is floating off into the, you know. I don't normally ask this in sessions on meditation, but could we turn the volume up? <laughs> the, who's the audio person here? Could we turn the volume up a little bit? Thanks. Uh, hi, um, thank you very oh. much for coming. Um, yeah, hold, hold your, that's is this good? That's okay. Better. Um, so, going off of uh, Will's question um, and dialogue, 
Uh, one thing I've noticed a lot here at Georgetown and elsewhere is a big focus on interfaith dialogue uh, between religions. Um, but I think that something that, well, in my personal experience that's maybe been lacking um, is um, dialogue between faith traditions and atheistic uh, believers, or non-believers, I guess. <laughs> um, and I've, I guess I've um, wondered how to have an interfaith dialogue with uh, non-believers and how, how that works. And in a pluralistic society, if you're leaving it to just interfaith, then you're leaving out a big part of the society. Um, so what are some things that um, we here at Georgetown or elsewhere can do um, as uh, leaders in campus ministry and other things to, um, to foster a, a better dialogue between believers and non-believers? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Well, there's a very good person on this, Tony Carroll, who teaches in another Jesuit institution, actually Heathrop in, in London, has written a great deal about this, about how he says you he finds, this is the English case, which is not maybe the same as the American case, but so he's found that the, the model of interfaith dialogue <clears throat> begins to be applied with certain, certain people who are atheists and all, but who really want to understand what's going on with us, you know, and uh, is beginning to uh, animate or discussions between, if you like, atheists or agnostics and Christians or believers of other, of other kinds. And see, very much the same kind of thing happens. You, you want to know, well, sort of what makes you tick? I mean, what, you know, what, what do you find really exciting and uh, inspiring? So you have to get people who are beyond, I mean, the Dawkins phase, right? Or and the parallel on the, on the Christian side. We're looking for Aquinas gives us a knockdown argument, or you know, evolution gives us, etc. People who are beyond that, and there are people who are developing beyond that. And what's interesting here is precisely it's what you're suggesting. It was the model of interfaith dialogue that people began to see, yeah, it could be one for this other kind of dialogue. Thank you. Is it? Yes. Okay. I, my question is about the uh, political implications of all this pluralism. The American political system is terribly fractured, and uh, there's a lot of um, fear and hatred among the people for different reasons. And I was wondering if there's a way, if um, you can have a common political culture or a working political culture as you continue to uh, split uh, into pluralistic, smaller pluralistic uh, groups or societies. Well, you see, the, what seems to outsiders like me to be uh, very dangerous in the American political system isn't really pluralism. I mean, pluralism is a sense that, yeah, there are different standpoints on this. I don't agree with the others, but there's something legitimate in their having that position. And we want, I want to, in political terms, I'd like my view to win over your view, but I would also like to understand your view, and I would also like to ensure that we treat each other civilly because that's what makes a democracy work, right? So I have a double interest in your in your case, I want to I want to win, but I want to understand you, and I want to have some kind of, of uh, you know, uh, civic relation with you. I find in the American scene now, that, I mean, sorry, these Republicans, I mean, uh, 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 maniacs. I mean, they want to, they scorched earth. They want to destroy. And if if that is the way your uh, one society goes, it's very bad for the democracy, but it's not pluralism. I mean, they don't recognize the legitimacy of this other position. You know, it's not, it's not a matter of, well, we wouldn't go that far. We, you know, we want to have another, another method. But so what's, I think, threatening the American and some other societies today is not pluralism. I mean, I could say the same thing about certain populist movements on the right in Europe who want, you know, just want to throw immigrants out. Mm. This is beyond. It's beyond the, the, the bounds of, if you like, a civic ethic. 
where you accept these other citizens as citizens. You don't agree with this, you don't agree with that, but you recognize you have to work with them. And that, that is a, so this is a danger that is threatening many democracies. I entirely agree with you, but it's nothing to do with the type of pluralism that I'm talking about. Thank you. Uh, okay. Then there's one over here. Hi, um, my question is about um, what you see uh, as kind of the future of religion in general uh, with this movement of secularization and pluralism. On the one hand, I think you've gotten um, a great increase in spirituality, um, and, uh, but maybe perhaps a departure from tradition and from doctrine and things like this. But on the other hand, um, I think a lot of um, religious have kind of gotten more defensive on their doctrine as all these people are kind of leaving the tradition behind, sorry, um, leaving the tradition behind, um, which has caused it kind of people to go on the defensive and to defend their religion, defend their faith, but perhaps lose the spirituality of it. So um, my question is, do you see um, this great divide of those who are spiritual but have no tradition and those who have all tradition with no spirituality, or do you see this blending that people like Thomas Merton were able to do, perhaps even like Tolstoy, um, uh, in, a, in a sense. Um, so I was wondering where you see us headed as religions. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. No, I mean, I think that what we're dealing with, um, I mean, the, the question, what's the future of religion, is <laughs> every kind you can conceive of. I mean, there are going to be very, very, very many different forms. So the issue is going to be, how these forms can live together. Now, this is particularly this is this is poses itself in a particularly acute way for people who belong to the same sacramental union, like Catholics. Right? We have to get along with each other. We have to understand each other in a more intense, more you know, uh, intimate in a sense way than we just have to understand everyone else in our society. And we have to get over the business of not tolerating the other or wanting the other to, to cease to exist. And this is going to be difficult, but it's not impossible. I mean, in other words, a lot of the suspicions of the new forms of spirituality in the church on the part of people of more traditional kind are based on not seeing the way in which these new forms are also connected back very deeply to the tradition. And what is needed is more exchange of that kind with a greater degree of, of mutual sense of the, the worth of the others. I mean, there is, you know, the, we, have, we who belong to this, you know, maybe if you like the <laughs> renew, more renewal-oriented people have to recognize that the, you know, there's, there's a beauty in the Latin mass that these people really see, and, and that shouldn't be uh, <clears throat> simply, simply put down and so on. So there's a long road to go on this, in this particular direction. Thank but you. If, you know, time for one more. Um, so I really appreciated your, your different um, groupings. One of the questions I have that I think comes out of personal experience is, you know, what if the seekers are lost? So what about teaching of different faith traditions? Because I feel like some people pick up, you know, half understood bits of Buddhism here and, yeah. you know, um, Christianity here and, you know, pagan tradition here. And they're combining them in ways that um, don't, they don't honor the traditions that they came from. They're sort of very misunderstood. And also, what about poor teaching that's leading some in my generation to kind of take their religion sort of radioactive, like maybe we're seeing in um, some parts of the world today? So uh, I wondered if you had any thoughts on, you know, how we can lead seekers better. Yeah, I, mean, I think that you have to hope, and you can even encourage this development, that people who take a little bits here, a little bits there, will be induced to go farther. I mean, why? Why does this bit of the Christian tradition, that bit of the uh, Aboriginal, why does that uh, excite me? Well, let's see if I can find what the source is. And there, that, hopefully, the people can be drawn beyond that. Right? And sometimes they will perhaps lead to certain kinds of fusion and synthesis which are not superficial, which are actually 
quite quite deep. But I mean, you know, if people are satisfied with kind of bits of search that don't get very far, you know, that's they can get stuck in that kind of um, in that kind of you know very unsatisfying superficial level. It's certainly true. Certainly true. And the the Dalai Lama always says, "What well, you can't put a sheep's head on a yak's, yak's body." body. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I think the, the, the drama has obviously um, Given up. surrendered. <laughs> <laughs> we won. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much. I, I, I thank you on behalf of um, uh, the John Main Center here at Georgetown and uh, all of us here in Riggs Library for wonderful uh, vistas that you've opened up for us and clarity that you brought to some areas where I think we're often where we feel confusion or lack of clarity is where we begin to feel pain and also anger and uh, act unreasonably. So you, I think your clarity and has really helped, helped many of us as it has helped many around the world. And also to thank you for contributing to this tradition of the John Main Lecture here. Um, those of you who might be like to uh, find out a little bit more about your thoughts on John Main, uh, Charles did a chapter in uh, a book we brought out for an anniversary a few years ago called The Expanding Vision, John Main, The Expanding Vision. And your talk at that seminar is, uh, is in that. So Charles, thank you very much again. And we invite you all to um, some refreshments just a few feet away, but thank you very much. Thank you.